Hi guys, today we have Derek Kinjora, UX writer at Wix Kiev. Hi Derek. Hey Eugene, uh, nice to be here with you today. So we're both working for Wix and we had an experience of working together for half a year. Derek, how it was? Was it nightmare or... Um, it's interesting that we're still speaking to each other after that experience. I hope we'll not stop. <laughs> uh, seriously, though, um, I think, you know, the way how we work together and some of the other designers that, um, in Wix is really a model for how UX writers and designers should be working together, um, that we don't hate each other, that we actually work together, we bounce ideas off of each other, and, you know, and also we're still friends after working together. Yep. Yeah. You have such an interesting experience. You have been living in different countries. Just what, what I know from, from you, Derek, that you're originally from United States, from Arizona, and you have been living in China, also in Saudi Arabia. I know where else, but how come? How have you started living in Ukraine? And what was actually your path of UX writer? Uh, well, I moved to Ukraine for the great root vegetables that we have here. Um, but... Uh, basically, I graduated from university uh, in 2008, which was you know, a wonderful year with great career opportunities and prospects. Same as 2020, actually. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like I like how our, our once in a lifetime economic crisis is happening oh, 12 years later. Um, so, uh, but basically, I, was, I actually, my training was in to be an English teacher, teaching English as a foreign language. Uh, problem is, you know, there weren't a lot of great jobs. So I said, okay, let me try something cool. Uh, so I taught in China for a year. I was like, okay, I like this. I'll do one more year working abroad and move back to the U.S. Uh, I picked Ukraine as the second country to, to work in. Uh, just because I have, you know, uh, roots in Eastern Europe, uh, studied Russian a little bit. So I'm like, okay, why not? And anyway, I liked it so much. Uh, you know, great root vegetables here and all that good stuff. Um, <laughs> friendly people, smiles, uh, great weather. Uh, just decided, you know, why not? Um and then it wasn't a linear path. Uh, I worked here for a few years, then uh, decided to do another year in China again, uh, then did a year in Saudi Arabia. And then when I came back to Ukraine, which I think is kind of now like the sort of final, I'm stuck here forever coming back, uh, I switched to, uh, from teaching to writing. So the, this, is, this is great, actually. The good choice, because as you said, people are very welcoming and very smiling all the time here. So I can understand you. It makes total sense. And what are you doing currently and what kind of responsibilities do you have at Wix? So uh, officially I'm a UX writer, um, uh, but my where my real role is, is opening up new products at Wix. So in just under a year and a half, uh, I've launched four products. Uh, blog importer, uh, where we take people from a WordPress blog to a Wix blog. Uh, Wix challenges, uh, which is kind of a cool, you can make like a training program app. Uh, Wix groups, which we also opened up. That's what, you know, uh, Eugene and I work together on. Um, and then my latest one is we're opening up a new analytics uh, dashboard. And that's what I actually just launched this week. Whoa. That sounds cool. And um, what do you see as the main skill set for UX writer? You know, the thing is, no one really understands what we do. Um, and I think some people think, oh, okay, well, you just, you know, add articles and make things grammatically correct. Um, in the same way, I think people think of designers like, well, it can't be that hard. You just, you know, have a sketch library, you add a button there. That's not hard, is it? Um, it's the same thing for us that, um, anyone who's not a writer thinks our job is super, super easy. Um, uh, UX writing, it's really the same thing as UX designing. Uh, the difference is that rather than focusing on the visual medium of guiding the user through a product, we focus on the words, um, <clears throat> on the content. And so it, it's different at different companies, um, but you can have this sort of very high level strategy as UX writer of, you know, how are we going to communicate how this product works? Um, you can decide, <clears throat> are we going to use interface text? Are we going to use knowledge base links? Uh, what vocabulary are we going to use to describe things? Uh, even for a very simple product, you suddenly have lots of features, lots of functions, 
And you really have to, as the UX writer, decide uh, the language you're going to use this all in, uh, the audience that you have, and then that also determines what words you use. Um, and all of this, uh, how are you going to communicate things? Like, are you, do you want to use push notifications, emails, both? Uh, do you use a toast? You know, do you use a pop-up, a light box? Um, and so ideally, uh, the UX writer should be sitting there with the designer and, you know, the PM and saying like, okay, I get this is what we want to do. Here's how I think the best way to communicate that is in terms of content. Um, and that's one part of it. Um, the other aspect that Wix at UX writers uh, are heavily involved in is localization is that um, in a lot of ways I end up do being like the coordinator for um, 20 plus translators that create um, a localized version of our products. And so, uh, I mean, generally speaking, UX writing, because it's such a wide uh, field right now, there's not a lot of like uh, defined things. It can, you know, you can really specialize in whatever you want. Um, you can yep. really be into the, the, the user experience, that aspect of it. Uh, you can be more into the technical stuff, like uh, how to make that, make it actually work. Uh, the nuances of playing around different types of spacing, for example, um, you know, using, you know, little things that are almost like uh, on the borderline of front end development, or you can also be really into the localization thing um, and making sure that, you know, your text works in, you know, multiple languages. That sounds reasonable. And what about the ideal process between UX designer and UX writer? How do you see it? Uh, ideally, um, the product manager tells the developer, they put it into production, and then the designer and I accidentally notice it in production, and then we decide to add text and fix the design. This is cool, but let's think about <laughs> ideal picture. Uh, so, you know, ideally, um, you know, in the sort of ideal world, um, the product manager um, kind of gives a little bit of inspiration of where we're going. Uh, and then the designer and I sit together and hash it out. Um, you know, it's really a collaborative process, uh, a lot of back and forth. It, do it doesn't have to be antagonistic, but it, it's like, you know, we need to communicate this information. Uh, I think this is really important to communicate. And then maybe the designer will be like, mm, but we only have this much space. Or, um, you know, the designer can really uh, add a lot of ideas like, well, a, why don't you put it, you know, in this type of, you know, presentation? It can be in a uh, modal, it can be in a toast. Uh, and then we just kind of run back and forth. And um, we both have sort of the same idea, but, you know, the same goal. Uh, but the designer can add a lot of how, how to do it. And then I can also step in um, something I can say directly working with a certain designer. I won't mention any names. Um I think with both PMs and designers is a tendency to want to name everything, to make this the feature I'm working on. Uh, a lot of times I see my role as simplifying things. Um, instead of creating a name, um, instead of having like the create this flow, it's just a, well, let's just have a button that says make, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. And so I, I think that's in some ways, um, Maybe I'm like this, the, the sounding board, like, hey, that's a little too complicated. Not, let's not do it. But um, ideally, in an ideal world, the designer and the writer, um, we sit and we work together. Uh, we hash it out, whether it's in Figma or Sketch, together. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't happen at a lot of companies. Um, a lot of companies, um, the designer just puts Laura Mipsum in there. Uh, sends it off in Zeppelin and then says, you know, the writer, oh, yeah, just add this later. Um, and you can really see cases where that happens. Like, it doesn't, it just doesn't look nice. You can tell the text was an afterthought. If talking about your specific field, which top three skills you see as the most important for UX writer? You know, like, uh, the canonical answer is supposed to be that you're a good writer. Um, ironically, I would say that's not even anywhere close to the top skill. Um, what I find uh, is really helpful to me is um, the ability to kind of step back and critically think about something. Um, 
in the sense that I can look at this and go, eh, no, that ain't going to work. Or to really look at something and pretend like, well, I don't have to pretend very hard, but like, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm a complete idiot. I don't understand how this works. And then try to uh, make something that's idiot proof that, you know, anyone can use. Um, and once you kind of have that mindset, it's not hard then to write the text that you actually need. Uh, the other thing I'd say organization is super critical because in most cases, UX writers have a bunch of irons in the fire. Uh, you have things going on all over. And so the ability to really kind of keep that, um, you know, all together and not lose it um, is really, really critical. Um, and, you know, the then I guess, you know, the, the other thing, you know, the very bottom is like, you know, being a good writer in the sense of being able to creatively um, tell something. But this is a, it's a dangerous thing, this creativity, because I think some products go overboard on the creativity side. Um, you know, sometimes when things are too fancy, too well written, like too, um, it, like, you know, I just want to use the product. I want the product to not get in my way. It's a tool. Uh, imagine like every time I'm using a hammer or a saw, like it comes out and tells me how cool it is. Like that's annoying. Uh, and I think sometimes, so maybe instead of, uh, being a good writer, I'd put in my, uh, third, my third spot would be hum humility is to know, to not put yourself too much, uh, in the product to know that, yeah, yeah you keep your professional distance, uh, to not like be super cool. And this is, I think, especially important, um, when you're dealing with products that are designed for user of users. So, you know, a lot of companies, you, the company are not talking directly to your customers. You're actually creating a platform for businesses to use to talk to their customers. So you have to be super careful uh, to not try to talk in a very, you know, uh, I don't know, loud voice. You have to let, uh, stay out of the way, stay neutral. Uh, so your customers that are businesses can put their own voice in. Yeah. So it should be even a bit neutral, right? Because you never know which case will be, which kind of person will be using this platform. And the, this is just, should be a message which could be universal at some point. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, imagine, you know, let's say you have an e-commerce platform. Um, I just picked that because that's something I've never worked on uh, to yeah. sort of stay neutral. But, you know, you could be someone that's selling flowers. Let's say you've been selling, selling flowers on an e-commerce platform. Uh, you could be, you know, someone could be buying flowers because it's, you know, their best friend's birthday. Uh, or they could be buying flowers because it's a funeral. Um, and so you have to be very careful uh, to have your messaging uh, work in both cases. Do you have someone on Twitter or elsewhere whom you follow and who inspires you in your field? You know, again, I'm going to give a sort of unorthodox, uh, non-canonical answer. Um, for inspiration, I think it's super important to not follow other people in the field. Um, because you get this echo chamber effect you get, um, you end up just copying other people. You end up just, everything sounds the same. Um, I guess now I might be stepping on designer toes, but, you know, every new product, every new Silicon Valley startup, I open up their webpage. I can't even tell them apart. They're all the same design, you know, they're all the same. And so, um, on the one hand, I, that's why I think it's really important to actually make sure that your inspiration is outside of the tech bubble. Um, and so just a smattering of journalists that have nothing to do with tech, uh, you know, read some essays about science, about like, I actually really enjoy philosophy, literature. Uh, and then when I do that, like, I make a point like, wow, this sentence was really well written. Um, wow, this. And so it could be something completely unrelated. Um you know, like I, I just like reading long form journalism and then really looking, um, you know, if I want to analyze it, like how is this flow? Like, you know, even, um, you know, people probably think I'm crazy. I'll sit and read something out loud because I really like how the way how the words flow and the sort of things. And I'm like, OK, when I write, uh, even if it's one sentence in an interface, you know, I need to make sure it has a nice melody, a nice flow. And I, I find uh, just 
using other products from time to time that are very different, um, I find is really the, the inspiration that I need because I need to look at something outside of uh, this bubble. Specifically, and part of the reason why that's true is that there's just not a lot out there on UX writing. It's so new. Um, it's like a completely new profession. And a lot of the stuff on the, uh, on the internet now is like designed for absolute beginners, like someone who like, uh, woke up yesterday and, you know, Oh, I want to be a UX writer. You know, I've, I've been doing this for four years. So a lot of that type of stuff is kind of like, okay, not as relevant. Uh, so that's why also for people looking, um, honestly, designers, like I think are the better inspiration for writers that they need to, cause you need to be thinking like a designer, thinking about um, how your words work as a design. So you were saying that the major part of inspiration you take from different sources and it, it makes totally sense. And... Absolutely. Cause like, for example, what happens, I see as a tech companies all the time, we're like, Oh, we're going to make a new chat app. So, Oh, let me look at what WhatsApp does. Let me look at messenger. Let me look at Slack. And I'm just going to copy whatever they do. Uh, and I, I, you know, we don't have to do that. Like, I, I think we can, let's be creative. Let's start from scratch, but do it in a good way. Not just not be random and make it, you know, completely, you know, new things for the sake of making new, but like find some pain points, rethink them and not be slavish and like, oh, well, this other company did it. So we have to do it too. Yeah. Um, and I'd even add on top of that, um, I see this happen a lot with UX writing is people will take like Google or Facebook as an example um, and say, oh, okay, well, they did that. Therefore, we have to do it too. But a lot of the success that Google and Facebook have, it's from, you know, the network effect. It's not necessarily because of good UX decisions. You know, when you already have a billion users, you can release a terribly designed product um, and it's still popular. <laughs> Uh, and so that's why I think, you know, if you're not Google or Facebook, um, it's better to, you know, really like, let's launch, let's launch a really good product. We can win on UX. If talking more about inspiration, did you have any kind of book or article or something that you read recently and impressed you a lot? Um, recently, I stumbled across an older book, but I read it recently. It's called The Laws of Simplicity. Um, it's kind of canonical in design, you know, speak, but, um, it was, you know, I just, you know, I read through it and, you know, it's not very long and you, know, you can read through it in an afternoon. Um, but it, you know, really kind of forces you when you read through it, it like, forces you to think about how can you simplify things? And I really think that's the core job of UX writer is to take something complex, make it simple. Um, so really, you know, would recommend that any of the standard books on writing, um, you know, there's a lot out there. Um, I mean, they all say the same thing. Use shorter sentences, use simple words. Um, you know, one thing I saw floating around Twitter was, you know, uh, every place you would use a comma, use a period instead. Um, you know, and that sort of forces you, okay. One thought per sentence. Um, don't use, you know, insane words that, you know, you'd only use like in an SAT essay or something um, to the point, you know, in English is very easy to use words, you know, with the Germanic origin rather than a romance origin, uh, you know. So, yeah, just, just keep it simple. Um, and I think that's my inspiration. Yeah, so keep it simple and short. Yeah, but um, there's also the caveat on that, like... Um, don't simplify um, beyond what's possible to simplify. There are complex things. There are really, really complex flows. Um, and don't try to artificially simplify them. Uh, you know, don't also go from the point of view that, oh, my users are stupid. I need to put one word here only. No, give them enough information that they need, but not, not more than what they need, not less than what they need. The question related to cultural differences. How long is it? since you are living in Ukraine? So, you know, I've been here on and off for 10 years. So basically, I came here 10 years ago. Um, in the last 10 years, I think I spent three of them not in Ukraine, but more you know, than seven here, basically. Yeah, so how can you compare your experience? Because 
it will be really cool to hear your your impressions as you're originally from western part of us and you you lived in different countries and how was it like communication with people from eastern europe and etc we even have a joke with derek when we see each other at the office in the morning we can start either like uh say hi in english or like in ukrainian or russian so there will be different response because like if talking in english it will be oh hi how are you yeah i i'm good yeah i'm good too so but if talking any kind of slavic language eastern european language you should uh say oh damn everything is bad yeah and don't ask back so what what is your experience living in ukraine You know, like, um, I'm sorry to disappoint, but um, Ukraine, um, I would say Ukraine today in 2020, in many ways, is closer to a sort of standard European, no, maybe even Amer- North American, you know, lifestyle than Ukraine of 2010 was. So if that makes sense. So um, there's more difference now between Ukraine of 2010 to Ukraine of 2020 than there is between, say, Ukraine of 2020 to, you know, my lifestyle in the U.S. Um, and that's been one, of, I think, one of the interesting things is how quickly things have changed here. And maybe that's one of the things that I really like about living here is um, that, um, of course, as I say, this is massive social change going on in the U.S. right now. Um, hopefully social change for the good. Um, but, you know, I took part of, you know, the whole revolution here was, you know, part of on Maidan and all of that. Um, and so I think that's one of the things I like about Ukraine in many ways, you know, there's this sort of youth energy here. A lot of young people want to make things better and change things. Um, you know, I know a lot of people that are really into, you know, various social causes and, you know, involved with working different NGOs and whatnot. Um, and that's just something I don't necessarily see in the U S like the, um, the activism there is a little different. Most people instead, it's just like, okay, you know, I want to, you know, get a nice job, move out to my little suburb, you know, drive an hour and a half into the city for work every day. Uh, and all that. Whereas like, I know here, I just, I like this more European lifestyle. Uh, part of it is that, you know, I have my roots, you know, my, my grandparents are from Poland. So it's like, this isn't um, radically different for me. I think that's kind of why I actually feel at home here. You know, I don't really plan to leave that um, by and large, especially in Kiev, like this really is a very sort of comfortable lifestyle. Um, I, and other, I'm trying to think of other cultural differences. Um, I don't know. Like I just, uh, I guess I just like it here and don't really see like anything that's, um, terrible or awful so um. yeah but but i still have a tricky question about is there something that pisses you off not necessarily like being now in ukraine but like in general in society in the world or something well i mean there are so many obvious answers to this right now i mean um obviously right now when i look at what's going on in the u.s um you know the massive black lives matter um protests i mean it's so easy i mean that's the obvious thing that pisses me off is systemic racism right now that's you know really you know ruining a lot of lives um the fact that a thousand people are dying a day in the u.s and nothing's being done about coronavirus um you know these are the obvious things so i, I mean Let me just set those aside because, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, we all agree on that. Let me pick something more fun, like from the tech world, is something that, uh, something that bothers me, uh, releasing buggy products and treating paying customers as guinea pigs. Um, and I think it's our job, you know, as the UX professionals on a product, as, you know, the designers, the UX writers, um, that, you know, we push for perfection. Um, we want everything to be perfect, no bugs. We want everything to be understandable the first time you open it. Um, and for me, like I look at products that I think are just beautifully designed. Um, take for example on Mac and iOS things, uh, this like, you know, sort of organization app. I mean, things is beautiful. Um, you know, I wish every app would work like that. Um, you know, no bugs. Uh, and it's very clear, like, 
their approach is they don't treat their paying customers like guinea pigs. Um, they don't treat them like as you know lab rats. Whereas when you look at some of the big tech tech companies, you know Google, Facebook, you know they're constantly running A/B tests on people. They're constantly uh, they're releasing buggy software. Um, you know, even companies that, um, you know, should know better, like, okay, the latest version, um, the latest uh, update to iOS has a ton of big bugs in it. Um, and it's like, well, wait a minute, I paid how much for my iPhone? And it has a buggy OS. Um, and, I, you know, on the other hand, I see the tension. I, I think maybe it's, you know, the role of the PM, because, you know, if it, for, if it were you and me doing things, nothing would ever be released because we'd, it'd have to be perfect. And so we'd spend, you know, a year releasing one screen because it has to be perfect. Um, so obviously we need that tension that the PMs are saying, okay, giddy up, let's see, we, we got to release it. Um, otherwise, you know, there's, you know, we just would never do anything because, you know, this perfectionism would set in. Um, but on the other hand, like when you look at um, companies that really make a point that anything that goes out to market is perfect. Um, and has a lot of quality. I think that's um, so. If I put it down to in one word, um, lack of quality and uh, not paying attention to details. Because uh, I think so many things in the world uh, would get better if people just slowed down, really dug into the details, uh, and did their best work. Yep, makes total sense. So you you said that it works to find the balance and to make software less buggy and not treat end users as a, you know, like guinea pigs. So how do you think it could be improved? Like in the, in general, have you thought about any, any ways how tech companies can just make a better software? Um, I, I, you know, the great thing about being, you know, in my position is I can just criticize and not ever have to offer suggestions um, of how to improve. Um, you know, I think it comes down to us as professionals in the field to make sure that we're always doing our best work. Um, I think there's this tendency to let's rush, let's that's good enough. Uh, and, you know, it's important for us to know, like, hey, I'm a professional, I'm a professional UX writer, um, you know, in your case, you're a professional UX designer. Doesn't matter if it's some what we think throwaway screen that, you know, not a lot of people are going to see. We always need to do our best work. Um, and, you know, you can even look at it from a selfish perspective. Everything I do goes in my portfolio. You know, I always want to show my best work. Uh, and I think that can maybe, you know, changes the perspective. Because, I, you know, you know, I've talked to people that seem to just want to, oh, hey, that's good enough. Um, I've talked to UX writers that think their job is just to, ah, it's grammatically correct. Mm. <clears throat> you know, that's not good enough. We you know, really need to strive more as professionals. Yeah, sounds cool. Thanks a lot, Derek. It was a great talk, and I hope you enjoyed it. I did, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. I think it was uh, a lot of fun talking to you.